just one of them. Only one left! I think we got them all. Hit the dirt! Sergeant, get over here! Wait for my signal, Smith. Here they come! Wait for it. Wait for it. Now! On your feet, gentlemen. There's our armor! Smitty, we did it! Ha-ha! <laughs> Outstanding. I think we got them all. Look! Go, go, go! Damn fine job, Sergeant. You do this division proud. of 1944, following their success over the merciless German defenders on Omaha Beach, the division advances an average of 20 miles a day and eventually make their way to Germany's doorstep. Breaching the heavily fortified Siegfried Line on September 12th, the division crosses into Germany for the first time. In brutal house-to-house -house fighting, they capture Aachen on October 21st, the first German city to fall. That winter, in an act of desperation, Germany launches a massive offensive in the Ardennes, and the Big Red One is tasked with holding the line in what would later be known as the Battle of the Bulge. Eventually fighting their way back into Germany by January of 1944, they cross the Rhine River and continue to advance across Germany. The division finds itself in Czechoslovakia on May 8, 1945, when the war in Europe is finally over as Germany surrenders. In 443 days of combat, the division had suffered over 20,000 casualties. By the war's end, they had taken more than 100,000 prisoners and received 16 medals of honor, as well as the distinction of being America's most accomplished fighting division of the Second World War. From the early battles in the deserts of North Africa, to the rolling hillsides of Sicily, and into the darkest days of occupied France, the members of the Big Red One had been ordinary soldiers tasked with truly extraordinary deeds. Their commitment to success at all costs is reflected in their motto. No mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great. Duty first.
Listen, I got a lot of wounded to take care of down here. You better find a weapon quick and hook up with the Sarge. Throw a grenade, let's go! Just past the gate! In those trees! One of the hallmarks of the Call of Duty franchise is historical authenticity, and we take that very seriously, and that goes everything from guns to vehicles to the missions to the voiceover. So, I, you know, I started putting out a casting call for voices like James Matteo. They wanted someone who was very similar to my voice. And I was like, well, I'm not working at the moment. Jimmy Matteo calls me. He says, hey, we're going to do a voice for a World War II game. You want to? And I, you know, that's my spot on Jimmy Matteo invitation. I had told him, you know, I'll reach out to all the other Band of Brothers guys because we stick together and uh, see what they want to do. And everybody, you know, raised their hand like they should have and said, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. I've done my research to work on this game, but, you know, these guys from the Band of Brothers spent 10 months over in England. They had to actually go through boot camp, three weeks of boot camp. We call it actor boot camp because we don't want to take anything away from, from the people who really served. It was almost like having a VO actor who was a military advisor, and it was like a windfall for us. It's fun doing it with the same guys, so we already have that, that camaraderie, connection that we, we've had there, so it's a lot of fun. The game emulates exactly what we learned to be the real scenarios of World War II, about tactics, about maneuvers, about weapon operation, and the, the topography of the areas we were shooting in. And that's what's so impressive about it, because it, it looks like you're at a window participating in the actual events. This is my first time doing mocap work. Never experienced being in a sausage suit. <laughs> kind of makes you really self-conscious, but after you see what the product is, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. One of the, the real great things about doing motion capture as a group is interaction, connection. They can actually touch each other, they can move, they can grab each other's arms, you know? You actually have whoever is playing this character in the game, that character throughout the entire game will have that actor's personality, and you don't get that off of using a straight, traditional motion capture artist. So what you're seeing in the game is an exact copy of an actual human's motions. And in that case, you don't get anything more lifelike. They were doing a scene on, on a boat, and it's rocking in. At the end of the scene, Jimmy is sitting down, and Jimmy's like, ah! My ass is stuck. <laughs> you know, we put so much of our heart into this game, which is so dynamic, and to see the actors themselves and really getting into it just means that we're going to get that much more intensity out of that when we get it into the game. It's great to see. Plus, it's just fun to yell. We don't get to scream a lot in our normal lives, so it's just great to go into a small room and just lose your mind. Ready! My grandfather was a, actually a decorated colonel from World War II, ran an Air Force base. I grew up with a real sense of reverence for these people. They're all individuals. They all had names, families, became very personal. The willingness that these guys had to put themselves in the line of fire for what they consider to be the greater good of not just America, but of all the free world, it's the kind of characteristic in a human being that you're just, you're stunned to come in contact with. Big Red One is the 1st Infantry Division, uh, which I'm very proud of have served with. The name actually comes from the uh, patch that emanated from World War I, where just a piece of a German's uh, hat material was hung on, on the shoulder of the soldier, and that started with the Big Red One. The other units in the European theater disliked the 1st Infantry Division because the first thought that they were the number one and the best, and this was brought about by our generals. Brigadier General Teddy Roosevelt used to tell all the generals, there's only one division in this damn army, that, that's the 1st Division. The motto of the Big Red One is, no mission too difficult, no sacrifice too great, duty first. And they mean it. 
We had guys in the outfit, 24, 26. They had been through Africa and Sicily. They were seasoned veterans. I got a nickname, Yak Yak. I don't know why. <laughs> You know, that's the way us Irish guys are from Boston. I think I was the funniest one in the squad. I felt it was my responsibility to uh, my platoon to keep morale up. I spent a lot of time bigger at one. I made a lot of friends. We buddied together. We had a lot of good times together. This has been over 60 years, you know, and a lot of names just fade out. But he, he, his name will never fade out, obviously, because he saved my life, you know. You rely on that guy on the right and left. This stuff about apple pie and mother and, you know, the country, that's baloney. You sold it to, because you didn't want to leave your buddies. You didn't want to make your buddies ashamed of you. It was a regular army unit. It was well-trained, well-organized. They met their baptism of fire in North Africa, and it just built from there. Uh, they had a pretty bad reputation as being pretty tough guys, but they were fighters. I had been in the Army a year. I went in in 43, and when I joined the 1st Division, I'd already been in a year, private first class. And the guys from Sicily and, and Africa were very standoffish, and I found out why. They don't want to know you because you get whacked, uh, they get a friendship, and I understood that because these guys had been through Africa and Sicily. There were so many replacements uh, for the casualties they had in Sicily. When we were making the attack at Bija in North Africa, we got into and the cactus fence that surrounded the farm when the Germans opened up as they sucked us in. It was an ambush, really. When I got back to the company area, I found that I had taken a number of bullets through the pack of my back and had never even known it. That was one of the roughest um, battles that we had in Sicily. Behind me, two Italian soldiers came, and they had their guns leveled out right at my stomach. See? But I didn't panic. I said, Al, come here and talk to these guys. What the hell do you want me to say? <laughs> I said, well, tell them that they got no place, to, no future here, and so forth. So finally, the Italian soldiers said, all right, we'll surrender. I joined the 2nd Platoon. I was a rifleman. And there was relatively few people in the platoon. And I asked one of the combat veterans, I said, no, where is everybody? He said, oh, they're all dead or they're in a hospital someplace. He said, you got yourself in a real wrong outfit. On D-Day, I was the last minute replacement. So I never trained like, God bless these fellas did. Thank God I was with some seasoned men as the first hand from North Africa and Sicily because they, they actually gave me the courage uh, to uh, be with them. Was a, in a way, too, it was a proud moment when the coxswain dropped the ramp and the first fellas off got killed instantly. And somebody yelled over the side, and I went over the side, and uh, I lost everything I had. So I was over my head, and I started to swim in. Uh, I think if you ever saw the movie Private Ryan, uh, it depicts it exactly what it was uh, with the bullets hitting, the sound of those bullets hitting the water all around you. I finally got out of the water. I made it up almost to the shale wall, and I got hit with some shrapnel. Knocked me down. Of course, the rules were you don't stop for anybody. So the guys, other guys are running right by me, you know. And the fire was just completely intense. I got belted. I got belted four or five times. And the tide is coming in. And uh, this is hard to talk about, believe me. Uh, and I'm going to drown. And I'm trying to keep my head out of the water because it's coming right over my head, you know. Finally, uh, somebody came down from this shale area. Turned out it was my buddy, you know, and he couldn't budge me. Now, he came down on the fire, too. He went back, and they got another guy from Chicago. And he came down, and they finally they cut my pack off, jacket off with a trench knife. I survived because of him when a lot of my good friends were killed. The only thing that saved me was uh, we had galoshes on and, and the combat boots had a leather strap down here. It was a, a mine went off and blew sidewards and it, the leather was what's, what stopped it. And I didn't even know I was wounded because it was so damn cold, the blood froze. And after we got off the hill, I says, what the hell's this liquid? And I looked down at my, my ankle and my ankle was all cut up with shell fragments. Out of nowhere comes these Germans. 
I used my M1 rifle. I, I, I had the bayonet on it, on it because I was digging, trying to chop a hole. And uh, I went off with eight rounds, and, and I got some of them. And next thing, this one was up. This fellow was almost on top of me. And uh, I guess it was in instinct. Um, he swung his rifle at me, and I got it with my bayonet. And uh, to this day, that haunts me. It's an awful way to die. And uh, that's something I always have to live with. I got called back in that afternoon. And I, they sent word that he wouldn't see me. And I thought, well, what, I, what am I going to get this time? And he told me to pack my barracks bag. I was going home. And I had a 45-day fur. And I hit Kansas City on the BE day. And it wasn't safe on the streets in Kansas City on BE day because everybody wanted to buy you a drink. The best part of being part of Call of Duty 2 is the fact that you're working on Call of Duty 2. It's an incredible uh, opportunity. It's, it's an awesome game. And I'm really lucky. The team that we work with is the Navy SEAL team of video games. We just have an incredible uh, talent pool. Working on this game is kind of a dream come true for me because when I was a little kid, I used to look through all the books and watch all the movies. And now I'm actually you know, the guy kind of making these events that I read about come to life. To create the next chapter in the highly successful Call of Duty series, Activision brought two expert teams together. Treyarch, makers of the Spider-Man games, brought an expertise in console development. Grey Matter, developers of Return to Castle Wolfenstein and Call of Duty United Offensive, brought to the table award-winning first-person shooter experience for the PC. Some person had the, the wisdom over at Activision to go, I see a great combination here. Part of a video game is trying to give people a wide variety of, of uh, encounters and places to actually fight. But we wanted to also keep with one team, one, one set of individuals that fought through a whole bunch of experiences. The Big Red One is the 1st Infantry Division. They were considered to be the top-notch fighters. They're at the forefront of pretty much every major military action in the Second World War. In the design process, the team did extensive research, including travel to the 1st Division Museum. We actually found out that there's an actual Big Red One museum with a built-in historian who was willing to help us. And so we had a lot of detail that we could draw out of that and sprinkle throughout the game to, to really give it more authenticity. Even like down to the time of day, the type of weather that was happening on that particular battle, that kind of stuff. One of the cool things about Big Red One are the details, the small details that people might not notice. When we were doing the initial design for this level, we were looking through pictures, and we got the city of Troina, and we're setting maps up, and one of us goes, what the, what the heck is that? And there, I think it looks like a live volcano. Sure enough, a little research, there was a live volcano that was going off. So quick trip to the art department. Now in that level, we've got this big volcano in the distance going off. We try to get as accurate as possible. One of the perfect examples is the weapons. Our weapons guy would bring in MP40s, would bring in MP44s into the office. Pretty scary sometimes. We actually had the opportunity to go out to Las Vegas to fire the weapons, which was really cool. We have uh, various mics placed all around the entire range. You know, we have uh, stuff here. We have, uh, you know, stereo pairs, and we have uh, another DAT out there just floating. So hopefully we won't shoot it. Apparently these are pretty rare weapons. I've got a few friends in the, the movie sound post-production business who uh, worked on a lot of the big films. And so far as I can tell, nobody has the French and Italian stuff that we're going to be recording today. One of the gun handlers actually gave me the opportunity to test a theory. We fire light machine guns from the hip. Basically, you can run around and fire this machine gun that's, that's mostly designed to be fired from a, from a bipod or a fixed position. So we wanted to test the theory, and we fired it much the same way that the Marines actually would have fired it on beachheads in World War II. It looked like a scene from a movie. I mean, it was really cool. One of the things we try to do 
to create an authentic feel is to have other things going on around the player other than what he and his squad are experiencing at the time. So you may look down an alley and see, you know, some of your friendly forces, you know, going into a house or taking it out. The reason we, we really emphasize on the squad is because we really want to have the same feeling for the player that they would get, say, watching Band of Brothers or Saving Private Ryan. We really wanted you to go through this game feeling like that you were experiencing the um, events with a group of people who you, you know you get to know. Early on, what we've done is we've had their, the, the characters be clean shaven, you know, in very clean, tight, neat uniforms. And actually, later in the game, you'll notice that they have ha uh, facial hair, that they're dirty uniforms, that they their whole the way they speak, everything looks like they've been through a war. So you can actually see the progression in the characters that you're fighting with as they've gone through the battle too. From characters to animation, audio to game design, over a quarter million man hours went into creating the immersive experience that is Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1.
I'm Dan Copel, uh, lead designer for the multiplayer part of Big Red One. This map is Kasserine. It represents a small village um, outside the Kasserine Pass where the U.S. was trying to pinch the, um, the Germans, the axis between uh, the British and the Americans, and they were moving east. They set up in the villages, and then the Germans decided to counterattack. This is the first time that um, the US, U.S. forces actually got to fight regular German infantry, and the first time that they fought Rommel. This is uh, Alexander Conserva. I'm a programmer uh, on multiplayer. This map is great because it's a night map. I'm kind of partial to night maps myself. I think they just look really cool. And it gives you a lot of opportunities to hide in the shadow. Yeah, one of the nice things about this map is all the different uh, routes. There's obviously one main route, the road through the town. But going through the, the buildings and stuff like that, there's just uh, an enormous amount of different pathways you can take. So you can come up and attack them from many different sides. So even though the, yeah, the defenders can get there first to defend the area, um, getting the attackers in there, you know, coming up, they don't know which way you're coming from, so you, your element of surprise is definitely on the attacker's point of view. The neatest things about have this being a night map, in the, in the actual single player game, this is a, a daytime, a dawn map, and uh, we decided for the multiplayer that when we brought it over for multiplayer, we wanted to do this as a night map. And uh, as soon as we did that, we just fell in love with it. Actually considered changing the single player game, but then we decided that probably wouldn't be too wise. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this map's also unique in that, unlike a lot of the other mich uh, missions where they're more of a, a traditional Western European architecture, this has got a very different feel to it, a feel that not a lot of people are really used to. Yeah, for the uh, architecture, we did a lot of research trying to uh, make sure that it felt authentic, that it felt like an authentic Tunisian village, um, especially outside around the uh, area of Kasserine. So yeah, we took a lot of, went and got a lot of footage off the net and other places to actually get a good feel of what uh, buildings and, and villages look in this area of the world. When uh, people first start playing this map, they really think because of the, the big broad uh, avenue that runs pretty much through the, that's the focal point of the whole map really, um, they think that the tanks really have the advantage. But after you start playing this map for a little while, you, you find that the tanks are almost at a disadvantage because so easy to hide in the dark and to let the tank roll by and then just to blow it up once it's gone by that that uh, a lot of times you find people not even jumping in the tanks. Well th that's the difference between a, a unit that works together and can have uh, infantry support for the tanks I mean and that's that's something that's great about uh, Call of Duty and the fact that that kind of feeling comes out that a tank isn't that overpowering um, and like reality um, when, when tanks would go into villages all by themselves they get torn apart pretty quickly and you know you need your infantry support to, to find those guys hiding in the back of buildings. Dan Copel, lead designer for the multiplayer. This map is um, Mabage. We pronounce it horribly, we're not French. After the Allies broke out from Normandy, they pushed through France pretty quickly and into the Belgium area. This map represents an area um, of Belgium near uh, Mons and then actually into uh, Germany near Aachen. And this is where the United States started running into much more stiffened uh, German defenses as the Germans started feeling the threat of the United States coming into, or the Allies coming into, uh, Germany. And the battle around here, this area, was just, they decimated the towns and stuff like that, which is totally represented in this map. It's, a, it's just one big rubble um, over the, the Belgian countryside. This is uh, Alexander Conserva, a multiplayer programmer. This map is definitely set up very well for uh, Capture the Flag. We're all huge first-person shooter fans, and there's a lot of us that have been playing uh, first-person shooters for a very long time, and Capture the Flag is very near and dear to most of our hearts. One, ver one version or another, definitely. Yeah, one version or another, but when we, when we made our Capture the Flag, we basically sat down and said, you know, what is the most classic example of Capture the Flag? And we, we did that because we wanted to do just a, a, a regular good Capture the Flag that, that everybody likes. And we didn't want to try to get fancy and invent new rules or anything. We just gave a straight, hard Capture the Flag. This map is a, uh, a conversion of the, the first map in the single player game, Prologue. Um, for this, what we wanted to do was we, um, we actually looked at this map, we loved the map, but one of the interesting things about it, about it is 
that um, the whole axis part of the map, or the the axis, the base, and all that stuff, actually you don't play in the single player game at all. Um, so it really gave us a kind of a um, uh, what's behind the ca uh, the the curtain kind of a feeling that during the single player game you look at this and you see the front walls of all these buildings and look into the site you see that stuff but you really don't actually get to see what's going on behind this we would love the final product it actually turned out really really well and leads to a very big uh, open type feel for the map but also um, very constricting some of the pathways and, and tons of rubble and tons of destruction which is we love destruction this was a, a definitely a team favorite map. I mean, it just looks so great. It really feels like you're there. It feels like there's a war going on here. And when you get when you get this level filled with people, it is a war going on here. Tanks actually do a little bit better here than they do some of the tighter maps too, because it isn't. There there can be a little bit further away from all the houses and all the cover that the uh, the anti tank people can hold. The the interesting thing about it though is also is that since there is only one way for the tank to get across the canal that area becomes really contested and if your team can get your tank across that canal that really gives that team a, a bit of slight of advantage at that point in time now that their their, their tank is closer to the enemy's base. One of the uh, biggest things you want to do with uh, any of the game modes really, capture the flag's no different though, is you want to try to build up your rank as quickly as possible because every time you go up in rank you get a, you get an advantage depending on what uh, class of weapon you're, you've chosen, you get anything from more ammo, more grenades, uh, to a, a special weapon. Every single class gets a, a special weapon when they go up in rank. Um, there's the artillery strikes, there's satchel charges, there's um, spawning in with Panzerfaust. And really, uh, the, uh, one of the keys to any of the game modes is whether you're playing deathmatch, whether you're playing capture flag, whether you're playing domination is to really you want to build yourself up in rank because when you build yourself up in rank it gives you a huge advantage. I hope you guys have fun because we had a lot of fun playing it. Dan Copel, lead designer for the multiplayer project. This is a uh, Maps Terina. It's a uh, Sicily map. What happened here uh, historically was after um, the Allies uh, pushed the Axis out of North Africa, they wanted to uh, move their way up towards Germany and Europe, and Sicily is off of Italy, so taking out Sicily and controlling Sicily first would lead up into an invasion into uh, Italy. This is uh, Alexander Conserva, programmer on the multiplayer team. Domination is a mode that we brought over from uh, Call of Duty United Offensive. It's a, a very popular mode, one of the uh, the team's favorites to play because it, it offers the opportunity for a huge amount of uh, action and uh, that, that's what everybody really wants now. This map is particularly well suited to domination. I mean the, basically the premise of domination is is that you there are five different flags in the map. You've got to go capture the flag and then hold the flag for as long as you can. If you capture all five flags uh, uh, your team wins the map. Or if you gather enough points to trip the, the score limit, you'll, you'll also win the map. I mean, that was actually one of the big changes that we made from United Offensive, is we didn't feel that, um, that the domination had enough of an uh, incentive to be defensive to really hold on to the flags, and that it was, there was too much offense, that people continuously be running around capturing flags. This map is really exceptional for this uh, game mode. I mean, with its tight, narrow streets, with all the places to hide, with the, the different levels where you could be in the top of a third story building or coming up of a, out of an underground passageway. It, it, it's, really, it's really epic. I, I'd like to say this is probably was my favorite map when we were playing during, uh, mm -hmm. during development because this is, you know, just the look of this map is, is really awesome. I mean, the, the map designer, uh, Paul Sandler went went to great extents to make this map as realistic and accurate as possible. One of the interesting things in our, in our research, yeah, Paul did tons of research on this map to, to get it to look like for both the single player and the multiplayer map that, that we have as Truina. Um, the interesting thing is you'll notice in the skybox is the volcano, and that actually was a real volcano going on during the battle. I mean, off in the distance, it'd just be amazing being part of the 1st Infantry and fighting in a city and all of a sudden looking up and seeing this active volcano this is definitely a map for that kind of feel too because 
is, as Alex mentioned, it's so narrow, so tight, lots of little cubby holes to hide in. I mean, sniper heaven here like crazy. And uh, that so well leads to the, uh, opens itself for domination, is that, you know, you come, you hold a flag, you go find a couple spots, and you wait for the the, end, the other side to come. You know they're coming because you, when you start that flag off, they know that you're there, they know you took it, they know somebody's around, so they're looking for you. Um, and then you're just sort of waiting for them to come around the corner. The center section of the map, I think, is, is uh, really key to the entire gameplay. I mean, that's where the most dramatic fighting goes on because it's where all the roads lead. There's the, the three roads coming to the one spot. And then so people end up there fairly often. And also there's that center flag that everybody wants to grab. It's a really, really cool place to fight. There's all sorts of niches and cubby holes. There's a, a really great spot. Um, down one of the streets of, uh, up in the second floor balcony where you can set up an LMG that's perfect for just holding down that flag or maybe taking taking some defenders off the flag. This section right here is just where your fiercest firefights are going to go on. So I'd, I'd almost recommend saving this flag till last. One definite ability uh, plus about that is the fact that, yeah, the middle flag is going to be a little, it's equal distance from both of the spawn points. But then one of the negative parts about that is while you're trying to fight this, it leaves you, um, you have to control uh, to actually win the match by taking all five flags. You have to keep control of the two flags closest to their base while you're trying to assault a, a flag in the middle of the map. And that, that actually, I think, would be a, a pretty hard thing to do. I mean... But then again, controlling all five flags at the same time is difficult to do anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the things is, is that a lot of times in domination, what people will tend to do is they'll get caught in a little trap. What happens is, is they'll focus on one flag. Like, the, you know, they'll go and try to grab it and they'll die. And then they'll really make it a point in their, in their head that they, they got to get that one flag. The other thing about all that is that's why it's so good in this map is that there are so many small little extra little uh, passageways to get through it's like they don't know how you're going to get to that next flag you got definitely a lot of different ways to do that and if there's defenders taking one of the routes away from you you can always try a different route to get to to where you're trying to go to